So now I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker for the evening, um, who is David Perry. Happens to be a graduate of Harvard Business School. He was also the winner of Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year Award. He also happens to be a serial entrepreneur. Uh, he's currently the CEO of Indigo, a Charlestown-based company making the world work better, which is our theme, through innovative solutions utilizing plant microbes to increase crop yields in the agricultural sector. So I'm really interested in hearing from him. Previously, he was the CEO and co-founder of Anacor Pharmaceuticals, which was acquired by Pfizer in 2016, and was also the co-founder and CEO of Chemdex, which was acquired by NextPrize. So we are thrilled to have him here today, a local serial entrepreneur, to talk about his entrepreneurial journey, and hopefully he'll inspire uh, many budding entrepreneurs here today. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. I'm happy to be here. Tonight, I'm going to go through a little of my background. I will introduce two companies I'm associated with, Indigo and Farewell. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, what I think are the most important lessons I've learned along the way. Brief background, I'm, uh, I grew up on a farm in South Arkansas. I, uh, I went to Harrison High School, home of the Fighting Goblins. <laughs> I uh, was the first in my family to go to college, so I didn't get a lot of advice in that area, but I studied chemical engineering because I liked it. I went to the University of Tulsa because my high school girlfriend was going there. And it sort of uh, evolved into working for Exxon because that's who was hiring chemical engineers. I spent my first five years working in an oil refinery for Exxon. Um, it, it is not a glamorous job. It, I did learn a ton about how well-run companies work. You know, how do you hire people? How do you fire people? How do you handle a crisis? And uh, I I'm, was happy to have spent that time there. I can say that many of you who are probably going to be interviewing for jobs in the near future, if uh, if someone mentions you need to wear fire retardant coveralls to work, you should ask more questions. <laughs> so I, I uh, after about five years at Exxon, I started thinking about looking for a more, a, a high growth job, something with more sort of technology foundation, and concluded that I needed to get a, an MBA to do that. I, uh, I applied to Harvard, Stanford, and Wharton. And uh, Harvard was clearly my first choice, which didn't means that I didn't mind at all that Stanford turned me down. I, Harvard completely changed my life. Um, I mean, remember getting here, I'm a farm boy from Arkansas, a chemical engineer in Exxon. And suddenly, I got a much better perspective on how the world works. Um, I mean, I didn't know anything about how companies get financed. I didn't know anything about management consulting. I had never met the people that I met here. Um, truly two of the best years of my life. And I, I came with the intention of either starting a technology-based business or getting involved with a technology-based business. And, and in doing so, I wrote four business plans while I was here. And you, you'll see that this is a theme. I, um, the, the concept is that if, you have, if you're working on multiple things, you're, you're able to look at each of them more clearly. And uh, if you're only working on one thing, you're more likely to convince yourself to do something that, uh, that maybe isn't such a great opportunity. I, um, I co-founded a, a company here with a couple of postdocs, one from Harvard and one from MIT called Virogen. That company is still around, and it's in Watertown. And that gave me the idea to, uh, to found a company called Chemdex. I, I entered Chemdex in the first uh, HBS business plan competition and, and was a finalist there. And that sort of gave me the confidence to, to go and start the company. So that was 1997. And Chemdex was about business to business e-commerce. Most of you don't remember early 97. But the internet was just beginning to be a thing. So Netscape had just gone public. Yahoo had just gone public. Um, Amazon was in existence. And so people were thinking about buying things over the internet. But nobody was really thinking about businesses buying things over the internet uh, until Chemdex. And so we were sort of pioneering this idea in early 97. Unfortunately, I didn't have any money. In fact, I had less than zero money. I had deep debts from my, from my business school tuition. 
So I, I raised, raised $50,000. 25000 of that was from a friend of a friend in Kansas who owned a John Deere dealership. And the other 25 was from two credit cards. <laughs> so the interest rates were high, but there was no equity. Um, so I, I began to invest that money in raising money, essentially. I, uh, I sat in an unair conditioned apartment in Soldiers Field Park and, and called anybody who would talk to me. Um, I flew back and forth to California. And uh, on September 26, 1997, I raised $1.9 million. I remember the date because I had about $2,500 left of my original 50. I was roughly two weeks from being done and taking a consulting job so I could pay the bills. I, uh, I promptly blew the $2,500 in a celebration <laughs> and got to work because I figured $1.9 million was all I was really going to need. How could I possibly spend that much money? Of course, I figured it out. I then raised $13 million in 1998, and in early 99, raised $30 million at a $100 million valuation. And in July of 99, took Chemdex public. Um, 1999 was the beginning of the, of the internet bubble. It was a good time to take companies public. We had a few hundred thousand dollars uh, a quarter in revenues. But we went out at $15 a share and closed the first day at $26 a share, making us a billion dollar company. And we weren't yet two years old. Um, things continued to go well. By March of 2000, our stock hit a high of $256 a share. That made it, at the time, the fastest company in history to ever reach a $10 billion valuation. We were two and a half years old. And at that time, I was the youngest person to ever run a $10 billion company. It was a great two weeks. <laughs> what, what followed was the hardest year of my life. I, uh, I fired 400 out of 500 employees. I bought back debt. I got out of joint ventures. Um, we, we ultimately sold Chemdex for $230 million. If you had told me when we started the company in 97 that I was going to sell it four years later for $230 million, I would have been ecstatic. But that gigantic peak in the middle made it a much less satisfying experience. <laughs> and so I went away to lick my wounds. I, I bought a one-way ticket to the Caribbean, and I basically windsurfed for three months and tried to understand what had just happened, because it went really fast, I, so fast that I couldn't really comprehend what was happening as it, as it occurred. And I concluded a few things. I, the first is that opportunity is everywhere, and I'm going to talk about this more in a minute, but you know, the pace of technology change really creates an enormous amount of opportunity. Uh, the second one was a really painful lesson, which is that you know, strategy is not that useful to you without execution. Strategy is more fun. I, it, it, it gets the most attention, and that's what investors want to talk about. But I didn't yet understand how to make, make stuff happen. Like, how do you hire good people? How do you set up an organization? How do you get everybody pointed in the same direction and set goals? And, um, and I realized that if I was going to be good at this, I was going to have to learn how to be much better at execution. And then I concluded that you know, part of my nature is to work really hard. I had a, I had a bed at Chemdex. I, I didn't sleep there all the time, but one, once or twice a week I would. And if you're going to work that hard, you might as well be working on things that matter. And I, I sort of committed myself in the future that you know, to only focus on problems that if I solved them, it would be meaningful. So I began looking for other companies to start. And I basically took the same approach. I talked to anybody who would talk to me, and I wrote multiple business plans. And I ended up, well, and I, I decided that I wanted to focus on a company that had these four characteristics. I wanted it to be a startup, in, in part because I wanted to prove that the first part of Chemdex wasn't a fluke and the second part was. Uh, I wanted it to be in life sciences because that's the sort of technology I enjoyed the most. I wanted it to be in therapeutics because 
the idea of treating disease or preventing disease seemed like a worthwhile activity to me. And I wanted it to be a big idea. And we'll talk about this more in a moment, too. But um, I don't know. It's, startups are really hard. They're really hard whether you're working on a small problem or a big problem. So you might as well work on problems that if you're successful, you've done something worthwhile. In early 2002, I co-founded Anacor Pharmaceuticals. Anacor was based on a, a technology around boron chemistry. It's super technical, but it was a brand new way of trying to create therapeutics. And then I worked really hard for a long time. So from March of 2002 through November of 2010, we were a private company. So eight years, we raised $100 million, we made progress, but in 2010, we were still 30 or 40 people. You can fit that entire Chemdex chart into the left third of this chart. It, that's a lot of work with not a lot of recognition. And then we went public in November of 2010, and we were a $5 share stock for another two years. So I've now got 10 years of my professional life invested in a company that's still not worth very much. It's really hard to know at the point before that, that line starts to turn upwards whether you're using your time well or not. Uh, we then got our first drug approved. We got data on our second drug. And Pfizer bought Anacor a few months ago for $5.4 billion. So, so it worked. <laughs> But it wasn't obvious that it was going to work for most of that time. You know, if most of us get maybe 40, a 40-year 40 career, I had invested a, you know, a, a quarter of that before I knew if it was going to work or not. And I think the lesson to that is if, you're, if you want to be an entrepreneur to either get rich or, or be famous, there are easier ways. <laughs> you need to be really, you need to love what you're doing and be committed to your cause. Because there's a lot of times when you don't have el anything else really going for you. So I then made another transition. Uh, I ha again, I had a lot of stuff to think about. This stuff was more fun. Um, and I traveled all over the place, starting with four weeks of hiking in Nepal. And I, I started with a clean sheet of paper and said, what do I want to do next? And the bar was, you know, it had to be better than nothing. I could go retire, or I could go back to work on something I cared about. And I decided to focus the next phase of my career on food and agriculture. Um, it, it stemmed from a, a discovery I'd sort of made through figuring out what I should eat. Um, my dad had his first heart attack when he was 44, and, and I was 14. And that's, you know, it was a, a formative event. And my entire life, I've thought about sort of health and fitness and well-being. But it wasn't until three or four years earlier that I had really understood the role that food plays in all of that. And the more I understood about it, the more ridiculous what we were doing to ourselves seemed. Where we as a society probably have more access to fresh food and healthy food than any other society at any other time in history. And yet we're choosing to eat in a way that makes our fat, sick, and die young. And so, so I decided I would see if I could address those problems. I, and, and I listed three. You know, one is, how do we feed a growing population? Because right now, the population's need for food is growing faster than our ability to produce it. Two is, how do we produce that food in a more sustainable way? I mean, most of the technologies that have gotten us this far are things like agricultural chemicals and fertilizers and GMOs, things that many people think aren't particularly good for our health or good for the environment. And then finally, how do we reverse the trends of, di uh, of obesity and all of the metabolic diseases that come from that? So again, I wrote multiple business plans, and in this time, decided to pursue two. Uh, one for the bottom uh, question, which I'll talk about first, a company called Farewell. And then the company that I'm the CEO of that addresses the top two. So Farewell is a digital health company based in San Francisco. And it's intended to address the problem of the increasing problem of obesity. Today, 70% of Americans are either overweight or obese. Just let that sink in for a moment. That's two out of three people. Heart disease is the number one preventable cause of death. 
and 37% of us, more than a third, are either pre-diabetic or have phase two, or type 2 diabetes. We also spend nearly $300 billion a year trying to solve those problems through uh, drugs, surgeries, interventions. When it could almost all be prevented by changes in our lifestyle. Studies show that if you just do these things, 80% of preventable disease, 80% 80, 80 of chronic disease can be prevented. The five things are eat a balanced diet, be active, and the bar for activity is really low, walking counts, don't smoke, drink alcohol only in moderation, and maintain a healthy weight. Just show of hands, how many people do all five of those? That's pretty good. If I took out moderate alcohol, how many people would do it? <laughs> <laughs> so incredibly, less than 1% of the population does all of these things, which is why we have the aforementioned problem. If we, a little bit of prevention here can go a long way towards improving people's lives and reducing society's burden for solving these problems. So that's what we hope that Farewell will do. Farewell is only a, a year old, but we have physicians, health coaches, and digital tools that attempt to help people change their lifestyle, either around what they eat, menus, recipes, meal plans, activity, body weight, and activity tracking. It's early, but so far so good. Um, we've done five cohorts, 200 patients total. The first cohorts lost about 5% of their body weight over 16 weeks. We got better and better in the last cohorts losing about 7.5% of their body weight over 16 weeks. And most importantly, hopefully, we're teaching them habits that they can go on and execute later in their lives. We have only about 10 full-time employees now. We've raised $8.5 million, and we're going to set out to raise about another 15 here in a few months. So that's farewell. I'm also the CEO of Indigo Agriculture. So Indigo is focused on um, improving both the sustainability and productivity of agriculture. And agriculture is the world's most important industry. 40% so of our global citizens work in agriculture. It supports about $5 trillion worth of products. And of course, it sustains every single person on Earth. We've also, it's also a little behind the curve. So crop yields have been going up, but in the last decade or so, they're only going up about 1% a year. And if you project out to 2050, when we expect to have 9.5 to 10 billion people, that's significantly less than the amount of food that's projected that we'll need by that time. We're going to have to grow agricultural productivity by 70% over where we are today. To make that problem harder, there are some headwinds. First is water. We're currently consuming more water than the Earth can renew. So water is held in reservoirs, right? Some are above the ground. They're called lakes, and they can be man-made or natural. And some are under the ground, and those are aquifers, and they're much bigger sources. And both of them are dropping. So that's unsustainable and agriculture consumes about 70% of our fresh water. So you can't really talk about water without improving the water use efficiency of agriculture. We're also losing farmland. Uh, about 20% of our farmland is no longer usable, you know, in part because we're building houses on it. And the world's getting warmer, which also pr reduces our productivity. Not everywhere. If you had a farm in northern Canada, warmer the better. But for for most of our farmland, warmer temperatures reduce productivity, and we're expecting to lose about 3 to 16% of that over time. And modern technologies are less productive than they used to be. So we're not getting as much productivity out of agricultural chemicals and fertilizers and GMOs. So let's review. We need 70% more food. We need to do it while battling less water, climate change, and we need to do it while swapping out the existing technologies of things like fungicides, insecticides, pesticides, and chemical fertilizers because they're not good for us or the planet. 
So that's a real challenge. It's obviously one that requires new technologies. I'm, I'm a technology optimist, and I think we'll solve this problem. And, and Indigo's approach to this is to use the microbes naturally found inside of the plant, which are also called the plant microbiome. So the, the plant microbiome is a brand new concept, but it, it piggybacks on, a, on about the last decade's worth of work done on the human microbiome. So in the last 10 years or so, we've learned that the microbes that live in and on our body have an enormous impact on our health and well-being. In fact, you can take microbes from the guts of overweight mice and put them into thin mice and they gain weight, and vice versa. And there are credible studies showing that, that the microbes that live in and on our body impact our likelihood of getting diabetes or not, heart disease or not, uh, cancer, various allergies. And there are now many different therapeutic, human therapeutic companies that are progressing not drugs, but actually capsules of mac microbes. The idea there is that our microbiome works just fine until antibiotics. And then by taking antibiotics, we obviously killed a lot of bad microbes, but in the process, systematically but unintentionally killed the good ones. The same thing happened in agriculture. Of course, the, the difference is that these are agricultural chemicals. So using pesticides on hundreds of millions of acres of land has systematically wiped out the beneficial microbes in plants. So we believe we have the opportunity to, fundament, to, to find and replace the microbes in plants, improving yields, and over time, replacing a lot of the chemistries that are used today. We have launched our first product in cotton. It's now on about 50,000 acres of cotton in, uh, in Texas and surrounding states. And we expect to, to, to get about a 10% yield benefit or 10% less water as a result. And the photos you can see there are the difference. If you can't see in the back, the indigo treated ones look much better. <laughs> Trust me. So we view as our mission at Indigo harnessing nature to help farmers sustainably feed the planet. We have our headquarters in R&D in Charlestown. We have commercial offices in Memphis, and we're growing rapidly. We, spent, uh, we had about 40 employees in January. We have about 95 today. We expect to end the year over 100. And we've raised $156 million. Most recently, we raised a $100 million round in July that valued the company at a little over half a billion dollars. And we're two and a half years old. So a few sort of thoughts from my experience there. The first, echoing Michael, this is perhaps the best time in history to be an entrepreneur. You know, the pace of technical change creates nearly unlimited opportunities. Oh, if faster computing power mobile networking, DNA sequencing, the ability to do machine learning on huge databases, these things are advancing faster than existing organizations can, can adapt to. And that creates opportunity everywhere, literally everywhere. Combine that with a society that, that values entrepreneurship right now and capital markets where capital is available for these things, there's literally no better time in history to be an entrepreneur. The second is create multiple options. I mentioned that before. If you create multiple options, you are able to look at each option with a clearer head. So write multiple business plans, or write a business plan and have a backup job uh, in line. Because you, you want to make good decisions here. The worst thing you can do is not use your time wisely. So the risk is not failure. A failure you can bounce back from. But being in a, you know, devoting your time and attention, perhaps for years, to something that really isn't worthwhile, that's the worst outcome. Your best ideas will probably come from the things that you know best. You know, work, hobbies, passions, and interests. It, it's, it's not impossible, but it's really difficult to innovate in an area that you know nothing about. And if you look at big companies, there are just very few examples of it. Like the best ideas come when you can connect something that you know really well with a new concept. Um, if you say, 
but I don't, you know, I don't, I don't have those sort of experiences yet. That's okay. You can go find somewhere you can learn really fast, and then, uh, and then when you do have that experience, you'll be ready. Work on things that matter. It's sort of the the theme of the day. Um, often, I think entrepreneurs start with a smaller idea because they somehow view that as less risky. They think, if I, if I start with this, then it'll be easier to execute on. I, I think it's often, it's often the opposite. You know, big ideas uh, get people excited. They attract capital and partners and passionate employees. And if you succeed on a big idea, it's fantastic. If you fail, well, that's sort of second best. At least you were applying your talent and your energy to a big idea. The worst thing you can do is spend your time on something where the, where the outcome doesn't really matter and you're not learning very fast. And finally, I encourage you to just think differently about risk. Um, when I graduated from business school, there were only a handful of us that started businesses. So uh, at that time, the business school class was 600 and something, and I think there were five of us. And I remember when I talked to my classmates about what I intended to do, you know, they would say things like, wow, that's risky, or how can you afford to take that risk? And I was genuinely puzzled by the question because it didn't seem that risky to me. I mean, I wasn't using my own money. I didn't have any, so I was risking somebody else's money. <laughs> I, I was going to get paid, so it wasn't like I, you know, I wasn't going to be able to feed myself. Um, I realized that it might not work, but it's... I thought it was a big idea, and I thought I would learn really fast. And I realized that, that they had a different view of their, of their career than I did. You know, many of them had gone to the right prep school and grown to the right college, and then gone to the right banking or consulting or pre-MBA job, and then gotten into Harvard. And they were on a path that they viewed as really valuable, and they couldn't afford to take the risk to get off of that path. As a farm boy from Arkansas, and a chemical engineer. I didn't have a career. I just had followed things that were interesting to me. And so, you know, the idea of trying something new and failing didn't seem very risky. And, and I would argue that that is true for most people. You know, the, the career paths that you think of as safe, you know, banks can downsize. I, those aren't necessarily low risk options. And as long as you're improving yourself at the most rapid pace, then you're advancing your career in the fastest way that you can. So last thought, I ripped this off the internet, so I, it wasn't trademarked, but it did resonate with me. And it, that if you can find the thing that you love and the thing that the world needs, combined with what you're good at and what you can be paid for, then you found your purpose. That, that's not easy, I, and, and you probably, you know, you, you shouldn't demand that of your first thing. It's really hard to get there. I mean, you might not yet know what you love or what you're good at. But if you're learning at a ra the most rapid pace you can so that when this thing comes along, you're prepared for it, it's fantastic. Now, I was in my mid-40s before I got here, but I now wake up every morning grateful because I get to be right in the very center of that graph. And my most fervent wish for you is that you get to be there someday too. Thank you very much.